So hello, how I can pronounce your first name? Hi, uh, well, uh, my name is Victor. Uh, I'm from Latin America, so I'm, I'm glad to present today and I'm very happy to to be speaking about Jakarta E8 because it's the release that okay. everyone is. is okay, Victor, about. so it seems like you don't like Java and you would like to switch to Kotlin, right? Well, not really, but the, this presentation is mostly focused on an experiment that I did at my company. We are mostly a Java house, but we do also a lot of Kotlin deployment, uh, development. So we have, we wanted to integrate mobile developers in backend uh, development tasks. And to to be fair, I wanted to explore the real compatibility of Kotlin in the Java world, but at the same time explore another way of doing Java e applications with with Kotlin. So that's why I am presenting in Kotlin. I do mostly Java development from day to day, but today I'm focused on Kotlin. Okay, sure. That's, That's it. fun. <laughs> so then share your screen. Okay. I and let's go. My screen. Full screen. Perfect. Okay. So, uh, well, uh, as I said previously, uh, I am mostly uh, focusing this presentation on contrasting how do you how could you use Kotlin in your Java e or Jakarta e uh, from now on uh, deployments, but uh, using Kotlin as an alternative language. And as I stated previously, uh, I like Java. I do a lot of development in Java. Also, I do a lot of development in Scala. Not so much with JavaScript, I could say, but uh, in the end, I think that the factors I enables us to create great application is the, the Java virtual machine. So I am presenting the results of one experiment I, I did the last year in order to create microservices with Kotlin uh, to describe about my findings about using Kotlin and how Kotlin could fit in the enterprise world with traditional application servers, the new microservices that we are creating with MicroProfile and to present some of, of my conclusions. And uh, the first thing that I should um, I should present is that when people start to speak about microservices with Java EE or Jakarta EE, depending on his background, and most of the times the first question that I get is how do I start? Because I am accustomed to uh, transactional APIs, I am accustomed to enterprise Java beans. Uh, where do I start? So I think that a good starting point on creating microservices with MicroProfile is to use actually the 12 cloud native factors from Heroku. It is a well-defined methodology and culture that will guide you through this process because uh, contrary to the monolithic or application server work, uh, in here we have to create a lot of new deployment configuration and new pipeline configuration and most of our infrastructure will now be automated by using Docker or Kubernetes. But MicroProfile as a development tool will give you some focus for the external license configuration, the creation of backing services, uh, how to create process properly, mostly with the stateless REST or REST-like services, and how to create fault tolerance uh, applications and APIs by using uh, the disposability principle. So my presentation will be focused on this and how to how could you achieve these factors of the cloud native presentation by using just MicroProfile. And in the case of backing services, how could you mix MicroProfile with a traditional Jakarta e, e APIs like JPAs and Enterprise Java Beans by using Kotlin. So I will contrast some of Kotlin code in, in this presentation. And uh, when I started this uh, journey in order to research how could I create microservices with Kotlin, uh, I started actually with Java microservices frameworks because uh, I wanted to create this panorama or where, which tool could you use in order to create microservices. And I just found that the microservices uh, sector in Java will offer you a, a, a lot of options. And, most of these options could be divided into, into big categories, being the first one, the do-it-yourself approach, in which you will have this kind of uh, libraries that will help you to create your actual and your own microservices stack, and the enterprise approach, in which you will have traditional frameworks like Spring Boot or Eclipse MicroProfile with Jakarta IE, in which uh, I, I like to describe this kind of frameworks like batteries included frameworks because you basically have 
all of the models that will help you in order to create microservices. So uh, when I was trying to switch from Java to Kotlin in order to create my microservices, I just noticed the following thing. Uh, most if not all of the microservices or for instance, backend frameworks for Kotlin are actually Java frameworks. So the only framework that I found for creating backend services with Kotlin was Kator that is actually also created by JetBrains. So it was natural to explore also Kator. But uh, my need was very, very specific because I am creating software mostly for Latin America with its own kind of issues and goals and the evolution of technology could be different from other parts of the world. So uh, uh, my main issue with Kator and other kind of frameworks is that I, I'm, for me it's difficult to find uh, good software developers that get right the the reactive paradigm, especially with Kotlin, because uh, if you start to develop software with Kotlin with a Java background, in the beginning you will do a lot of Kotlin Java-like style, and you won't be using the, all of the improvements, let's say, of Kotlin or, over Java. So uh, considering my, my actual environment, uh, uh, after exploring Kator, exploring a little bit of Vertex, uh, Micronaut, I, I really enjoyed the experiment with Micronaut, uh, uh, in the end, I went with the Eclipse MicroProfile. Uh, my motivations were basically market motivations uh, to actually take advantage of my actual development team and to take advantage of the students that are being already uh, learning Java IE or Jakarta IE at universities. So, uh, why could you use Jakarta IE with Kotlin? And this slide probably resumes my vision about it. Uh, first of all, Jakarta IE standards are pervasive. It doesn't matter if you use Spring Boot or you are using Micronaut in one point or another, you will be using, in the end, some Jakarta IE standard. For instance, uh, Java Persistence API is everywhere. That's the most pervasive uh, standard that I remember from the Jakarta IE world. Uh, in Latin America, especially in my region, uh, that is Central America, it is easier to find Java IE developers because they have been there for 15 years and they will be uh, there for another 15 to 20 years. So it is easier for me that I am in the development management position. It is actually a factor to consider because you cannot expect to create a new team uh, from nothing. You have to find the people somewhere and the people here in Central America at least, uh, we have more, more experience in Java IE. Uh, the third factor that made me choice uh, to choose the microprofile stack is that not every piece of software should be over-engineered. And actually, Java IE, and once you get the development model with CDI and Enterprise Java Beans, it becomes easier. And as Adam says uh, a lot on his videos, it becomes boring because it is pretty easy to develop good and stable uh, microservices and REST APIs by using just plain old uh, context and dependency injection and Enterprise Java Beans. And in that line, enterprises like boring and old software stack, and me too, because I like to do other things. <laughs> For you to know, I like to go early to home. I like to uh, apply my knowledge in a good stack that is easier to get, that is easier to teach to other developers. So for me, it was a natural choice. And for my clients, when I go to present two options, in one option, I am developing with a new technology it is, I'm not sure if this will work on your environment, but I do a contrast with other technology and you say, well, you have been developing software with Java IE for 10 years, 15 years, and you could continue using your actual knowledge. They basically choose always the first, uh, the first option to go with Jakarta IE. And um, my final motivation is that uh, when you use Kotlin uh, as a development language, it is possible to attract more newer Java developers because I know that's not a decision that should be made. Uh, just take the technology because of the hype, but uh, we must recognize that most of the hype attract new developers, especially out of college developers. So it is possible to create fresh software with already running app servers that have been in production for a lot of time. So that's why I went with Jakarta IE. And in the case of the Clips Microprofile, so how, to, how could you integrate Clips Microprofile with Kotlin and Java IE? I must 
uh, highlight a little bit of characteristics that could be helpful in this in this journey. The first one is that uh, uh, this is actually uh, an image that I like a lot that Reza published uh, probably last year, in which he described uh, which are the advantages of using microprofile. The first one is that you could actually use the already established APIs that uh, everybody knows, at least Java Persistence API, Context and Dependency Injection, but these kind of uh, APIs were created in an era where you are actually assuming that the scalability will be achieved by uh, uh, enterprise application servers. So MicroProfile will give you basically these five factors in which you will uh, you will be able to create microservices by covering administration, monitoring consideration, high availability, security, and uh, resources management, as described in the previous presentation that you probably are, are following. And so MicroProfile will be focused on making easy to create and cover these five factors. And with a combination with Jakarta EE, you could include in your project uh, a set of already established uh, software standards. So the main idea when you are developing microservices with Jakarta EE, we and Eclipse MicroProfile, we could do a contrast. If you take the domain private development approach, uh, the basic development, domain development approach, you probably are doing the applications like this. First of all, you decide which will be your domain, and from that domain, you start to create uh, objects, aggregations, value objects, and after that, you map those objects to relational databases, or probably uh, no SQL databases. On the next uh, step, you probably are creating repositories with uh, simple repositories or complex repositories with some business logic by using context and dependency injection or enterprise Java beans. And to expose this to your clients, you have actually two, two roles. You could expose them by traditional ways, by using uh, frameworks like Java server faces for presenting this in an HTML way, or frameworks for SOAP services with JackWS. Or you could actually use uh, most and modern APIs by using JAXRF and exposing this with a controller. After that, so after you create your application, you are probably packaging your application in a WAR file. Or and when this application starts to grow, you start to separate the WAR file in a collection of JAR files plus WAR files plus other JAR files, and you are in the need to pack this application in an enterprise application resource. So you are probably extracting the WAR files and specifically many enterprise Java beans and packing this by covering other factors of development by using standard APIs like beam validation, JSON processing, JSON binding, and security. So if we go from the application server world to the microservices world, we will basically doing the following switches. First of all, and as probably you have discussed previously in the other presentations, uh, the Eclipse microprofile focus is mostly on CDI. It doesn't mean that ja Enterprise Java Beans will be gone in two or three days. Enterprise Java Beans are also pervasive and they will continue to be used uh, for at least five or 10 years, I I'm, I'm my guess. So we are basically focusing on architectures by using CDI, exposing our content by using JAXRF, and now we need to create our microservices and to pack them in a way that could be, that this kind of microservices could be invoked by using a command line interface like bash or something. Because in the end, if you are able to start your microservice by using command line interfaces, you could actually pack this microservice by using Docker. And after that, you could create a complex orchestration with Kubernetes, Rancher, or you name the orchestrator of your preference. So we will, be, we will be focused on this kind of deployment. Uh, yeah, I won't talk too much about Eclipse MicroProfile because this has been covered in other presentations. But uh, just to make a contrast, from the Jakarta IE world, we use as basis uh, already established standards, like, as I said, CDI, uh, JSON processing, JAXRS, or JSON binding. and uh, using this as basis, we could add a new set of APIs. Uh, most of the, these APIs focus on fault tolerance, metrics, uh, JWT propagation, health check, configuration externalization, integration of REST clients, open API to document or APIs, and operator tracing. 
So um, as uh, demonstrated previously, uh, I wanted to cover uh, not every API of Eclipse MicroProfile, but I wanted to cover an integration with MicroProfile APIs, uh, Jakarta e APIs, and also Kotlin as the development language. So uh, if you want to integrate your uh, project with Eclipse MicroProfile, you should choose one of the many implementations that are already available in the MicroProfile ecosystem. You can choose from libraries like SmartRai, Hammock, uh, Apache, Heronimo, Fujitsu, uh, just enough application servers or FATJARs uh, being one of the most famous, Dropbizra, Cumulus, Helidon, Open Liberty. Uh, today, we, you will have the opportunity to see many of these in action, or you could actually go to another, another focus, another, let's say, another way to prepare this kind of microservices by creating ThingWars that only include your code, and this kind of thing works will be deployed in a micro server like Fire Micro or Tommy Jack's Arrest. And for instance, MicroProfile has been so far so good, so it has been also included in full-fledged application servers. I've been using it also in, uh, let's name it, legacy applications by using Fire Application Server Full, uh, especially in Wi-Fi Application Server Full, so MicroProfile as Java is everywhere, so you could actually take advantage in any kind of deployment that you want. Uh, for this presentation, I will be focused on demonstrating this integration by using Payara Micro, but most of the concepts will be actually achievable by using any other implementation. So uh, uh, let's actually see the, the demonstration. In order to integrate Flux MicroProfile with Kotlin, you have to do uh, some manual steps. Let's name it manual and not so easy a step, but these kind of steps are also not so difficult. The first step that you have to do is to configure your build in order to integrate Kotlin to give Kotlin support, especially if you want to create hybrid projects in which you could include uh, Kotlin, but also you could include Java code in the same project. After that, you should basically include your microprofile dependency and possibly your extras like the full-fledged Jakarta IE, you could use Herculean for uh, integration testing, unit, the unit for unit testing, and so on. You could integrate uh, actually any library that you want or need for your particular needs. After that, you, will, you, you should actually configure the Maven plugin in order to integrate the compile phase of the Kotlin compiler with the Java phase of the Java compiler. Uh, and in the end, we have to do a manual configuration of the Kotlin plugin especially because we have to configure plugin, uh, this plugin for the traditional Java IE development environments in which you depend basically on proxy classes. Uh, most of the scope, uh, scope management in the application servers nowadays depends on the possibility of doing inheritance between the base class to the proxy class in order to be able to, to control the scope. So, you have to configure the Kotlin compiler to create inheritable uh, classes because by default, Kotlin doesn't allow inheritance in the way that we are accustomed to with, with Java. So mm -hmm. I will discuss a little bit of this, this details. So um, the, the basic dependency of MicroProfile, as you saw in, in Adam's video, is basically just include the dependency of MicroProfile and you have to choose uh, compatible uh, microprofile implementation that supports the version of microprofile. For this demonstration, I will be using the 2.1 version because I developed this experiment like the, in the beginning of the year, but I know now that there are the 3.0 version. Let's focus on this one. Uh, the second dependency that you are uh, obligated to include in your form HTML dependency, in my case that I am using Maven, is the Kotlin standard library. The Kotlin library nowadays has basically two main versions. The main version based on Java 7, that is mostly focused for Android development, and the Java 8, that is mostly focused for doing Kotlin everywhere that is not in the mobile development space. So I will use the Kotlin 1.3 version, and I need to include this dependency also. Uh, the third configuration that you have to do is to configure Maven compiler plugin in order to separate the Java compiler in phases. The default compile, test compile, Java compiler, you have to be explicit in order to separate, the, to separate these phases and to allow to the Kotlin compiler plugin to hook into your Maven lifecycle and the management of the lifecycle. 
And finally, uh, you have to configure the Kotlin Maven plugin. And my configuration of the general idea of this configuration is that you have to consider uh, all of the uh, architectural and scope management annotations in CDI and Enterprise Java Bean uh, by using the uh, all open uh, compiler plugin option in which you will include annotations like JAX arrest, path activator, the request section, application defending scope, basically any annotation that you will need to uh, to create the, your application and to let the application service to manage it, you have to include it in the all option annotation, all open annotation, sorry. So for this demonstration, I prepared it, uh, a, a little bit complex project because I wanted to stretch all the possibilities with uh, Jakarta IE and MicroProfile, and I've, I've included a lot of libraries in which you will actually see the full power of Jakarta IE and MicroProfile working together with Kotlin. And I also wanted to explore some Kotlin specific structures in order to develop my, my microservices. So for this demonstration, I prepared a project with Kotlin 1.3. Uh, it's basically the stable Kotlin version. I've included a, a couple of extra dependencies in my project, being simply log facade, a flyway for database migrations, and Postgres SQL. And to test the actual and future and the real compatibility with Java EE, uh, the Jakarta IE and MicroProfile. I have also included Enterprise Java Beans in order to see how this works with Kotlin and Java Persistence API in order to have this backing service uh, approach uh, uh, from the 12 flow native factors by Heroku. And from MicroProfile, I'm using context and dependency injection, JAXRS and MicroProfile config. And finally, for the testing, I, demonst I will demonstrate also an integration with Archelian the unit and running all the tests with, by using Fire IMBED. If you are interested in the details of this implementation, uh, I also prepared an article that is uh, already published on this song that is basically the state of Kotlin for Jakarta IE and MicroProfile. Uh, the URL is not so good, but uh, you can search for Kotlin and Jakarta IE in this song. Uh, this will be probably one of the few posts published there because not so many people is experimenting on this. And the actual source code that I will be demonstrating is already published on my GitHub. So you will give it a, a try. I will explain a little bit of the plumbing that is involved in this project. And after that, I will show you the, the actual functionality of this project. So uh, this project is mostly focused on created, uh, in creating a basic uh, crude that is, its main focus is to store simple phrases. You will see later which phrases uh, I could retrieve from the database. This demonstration will be running on Postgres SQL. Uh, so I modeled a JPA entity uh, and phrase repository in which I have the basically find, create, update, delete all of the operations. And also I need to use an entity manager. And after that, I am exposing this information by using a JAXRS controller on all of the uh, actual operations. Uh, this demonstration will be packaged in a micro pro, microservice or micro by, by using Fire Micro. This Fire Micro could be scaled by using Docker Compose or Docker itself, and it will be exposed by using an Nginx reverse approach that will offer you one of many instances of Fire Micro that will be running. And in the end, we will reach a Postgres SQL database. So it is a full fledged project. Uh, I, can, I cannot do live demos because I am already having a. I am already having a hard time by speaking English because it's not my native language. I am, I hope I am doing it properly. So let's see the demonstration. Uh, let's switch to the IDE and let us start. With. So first of all, when you do a configuration to connect to an actual database, I am externalizing the configuration of this database. Uh, I already externalized the URL of Java Database Connect Connection API, the Postgres uh, password, and the Postgres data database name, because my first intention by creating this microservice is to actually be able to move it from my computer to any any cloud that this that has compatibility with Docker and Kubernetes. So uh, the first class that I want to present is the ADM phrase. As you can see from the code, uh, this place is very tiny compared to its equivalent in, in Java because basically I get rid of any getter and setter. I'm not so sure about the real value of 
get rid of get error setters because basically any any IDE will generate that for you. But when actually you could see this code, it became very concise because you are actually able to see the whole structure of the of the entity by using just one, two, three, four, five, like ten lines. I am also combining and using traditional uh, JPI annotations like entity table, the table generator in order to generate a unique sequence uh, and traditional JPI annotations like annotating the identifier, the generated value and mapping the column. And also you should notice that a special consideration for Kotlin is that since Kotlin is mostly focused on no allowing null types, you have actually to do the long value like nullable because otherwise the the database will create uh, a value for a non null value and this will create a conflict when you are trying to persist your data. Mm -hmm. uh, on the top of the uh, on the entity I created a repository. In this repository you could see the advantages of using Kotlin because I could basically mm -hmm. create a repository in 42 lines without considering the imports. Uh, I am actually trying to inject an entity manager. This entity manager is being produced by a CDI entity manager. Uh, I am demonstrating the long way of doing functions by using a post construct init function. But in the end, you could use the concise syntax of Kotlin by using a just one line method, like in the create, update, find by identification or delete. And one of my favorite is Favorite is how could you create uh, queries by using the multi-line construct in Kotlin. So since I am using IntelliJ IDEA, uh, I could create multi-line uh, JPQL queries by using just uh, triple quote uh, syntax. And this, uh, uh, to be fair, this, uh, this, re this looks really good to me if compared to Java because I don't have to add a lot of lines and a lot of zoom, 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 zoom. So you could actually write your Java uh, your query directly in the block of text. So finally, this repository is it looks pretty much like a Java code, but in a more compact way. And in fact, you have to use some specific Java class annotations in order to be able to create uh, type of uh, queries like I am, I'm doing here. But after that, I have to expose this repository by using a, a controller. So I also created a controller. And the code will be very familiar for all the people that is, that is already creating applications with JAXRS. In this controller, I also injected my repository and I injected another login service that I created previously. And the takeaway from this is that uh, when you are using uh, dependent injections frameworks in Kotlin, you have to be explicit that someone or somewhere or some framework will be responsible to create the instance for this actual property in the IDM uh, IDM phrase controller class. Otherwise, this will give you a compiler error that you are actually trying to create an application with a null value and that's not allowing in Kotlin. So by declaring them by private late in it, this will be actually allow you to inject values without declaring explicitly uh, how to initialize this property. The source code for the application itself is not so different from any JAXRS application, in which you could actually observe that in some cases, like in the find dog method, I am creating a function with just one line. But the thing is with the parameters that I am using, like the query parameter and establishing a default value in my parameter, I am spending more code on the annotation than on the implementation itself because, again, Java and Jakarta IE are boring technologies that already have all for you and are easy to use and are so easy that writing this kind of code is basically straightforward. In the get method, I have the put method and I am basically trying to represent the traditional uh, ways to create responses from the uh, JAXRS method. Like in here, I am creating a repository. And the, the, the final method that I, I want to highlight is the delete, because in here I am actually using another Kotlin specific constraint, like the LBS operator, in which I am able to consult my repository in order to try to find my entity. After that, if I don't find the entity because I received a new value, I am actually able to create in one line the response uh, directly without doing a, a lot of 
implementation with if sentences or something like that. So it's actually pretty convenient to use this kind of construct in Kotlin because uh, in Kotlin you could do these kind of things that they basically are inherited from, from Groovy. And that's the structure of the application. Uh, after that, I have to do a lot of plumbing. Well, not a lot of plumbing, a little bit of plumbing. First of all, I created an entity manager producer. This is a traditional entity manager producer. Uh, I mm. tend to create this kind of producers to use them with extensions like Delta Spike or other CDI extensions. So in here, I'm basically taking advantage of using a, a, a Payar micro, and I, I am able to inject the persistence unit that is the only persistent unit in this, in this project. So I am able to create a CDI producer and to control actually the life cycle on the persistent manager by creating an entity manager request scope default. And after that, I am able to close their entity manager if I need some kind of transaction in my repository by declaring the disposer by using disposes and default. So you could observe that I am not using any kind of a special framework or special annotation, just plain old CDI annotations. And to make, the, to make this a little bit uh, uh, fun, I also created an uh, enterprise uh, Java Bean. This enterprise Java Bean is mostly focused on bootstrap the, the actual database because I am declaring an application scope singleton start of enterprise Java Bean in which I am able to bootstrap the creation of my database by using flyway migrations. In here, I am, uh, I am also using a little bit of uh, manual plumbing to try to inject uh, uh, a context lookup in a plain old data source, but by not by using annotation, but by using plain old Java code and see if this works. And I could also uh, use Kotlin specific uh, construction. Like in here, I, could, I am actually saying in Kotlin code that this data source could be an actual instance of the data source, or this could be basically null, because in Kotlin, uh, you have to check in the code specifically if things could be null. After that, if the data source is not null, and only if it's not null, I could actually use and wrap all of the logic of my database bootstrapping in a let construct. Otherwise, if I am not able to get a connection to the database, uh, this block of code will be simply ignored because uh, this is like uh, a soft try and catch, let's name it like that, that you could use when you are implementing your, your source code with Kotlin. After that, I do a classical sideway configuration in which I do the retrieval from the data source. I establish allocation for the uh, SQL scripts that I've created for Postgres, and I start the migration. Uh, you could also see that I am using strings constructs in here in order to avoid concatenation. So I am using basically templates that are already present in, in Kotlin. So I successfully stretched most of the pool features of Kotlin by using them in, in the Jakarta project. And finally, uh, I created a log producer to see how difficult it is to produce logs by using a injectable service. So I created a log producer, which creates an instance of log factory by considering an injection point. And if you see, this whole logic could be created just with one line. So I don't like the fact that most of the people tend to compare languages by just comparing the number, the quantity of lines that they use on their, their source code. But uh, to be fair, this makes your code a little bit readable once you get all of the specifics in Kotlin. So finally, I will demonstrate uh, how this process will look from the uh, actually running. So let's open a terminal. And to integrate this project, I created the following configuration. It's basically the same that I described it by using the slides. So let's just recap it. And in here I have a dependency with Java IE. In order to have all the dependencies like interpret Java Beans and Java Persistence API, I have the clear the dependency on microprofile. Uh, in order to get an abstraction over my logs, I integrate the simple log facade. Uh, I have my process SQL driver directly included in the project because I have to get that connection from the microservice. 
And after that, I need the dependency on the Kotlin standard library. I have my migrations controlled by Flyway, and all of my testing will be uh, will be done by using Junit, the Unit, Mokito, or Killian, and Shrinkwrap in order to use the Payara Embed version in which I am running the integration tests. Uh, I wanted to show also that I need to integrate uh, the Kotlin Maven plugin in which I have to be explicit and say, please Maven include all the source code that is uh, written in uh, SRS main Kotlin, but uh, also include all the source code included in SRC main Java. And I do the same for the test compile phase in which I say, please consider all the tests that are included in the Kotlin directory, but also consider all the, all the tests that are included in the Java directory. And finally, the configuration for the all open plugin that is part of the Kotlin standard configuration in which I've been included. Please, for all of the enterprise annotations that are coming from Jakarta IE, please generate open code in which the application server will be able to create inheritable classes so this could be actually enable the application server or the micro framework in order to uh, to create uh, proxy classes and all of the scopes that you and life cycles that you already know from the card IE are also usable by using Kotlin. And finally, I am using uh, a configuration in order to separate my testing from the actual compile phase because this was a little bit uh, of an experiment, so I wasn't running the tests all the time, so I separated the test to the verified test. And I want to show you the integration test that will be executed by this application. So uh, in the case of the integration test, since I am using Archelium, I could actually do a direct injection of my repository, that is the component I, I am testing here. For the people that is already using Archelium, they could notice that uh, I, uh, I actually had to use a companion object. This is probably one of the situations when your Kotlin code will be bigger if compared to the Java code, because in Kotlin, uh, per definition, you don't have uh, static, uh, static methods. You have to create companion objects, and inside the companion objects, you have to create the actual methods. And in order to be compatible with Archelium, I have to be explicit and say, please create a Java virtual machine static method. And after that, I could actually use the deployment annotation to Archelium, in which I create the, the testing wire, in which I include just the repository. I will add my resources, the, like test beans and beans.xml. And I am doing a basic persistence test in which I am persisting a well famous phrase that I forgot to change this before this presentation. But uh, this is a, person, a phrase by Linus Torvalds, so I am trying to persist it by using the, the repository. I am retrieving the, uh, the entity that I just persisted, and I am just testing, well, please check if this uh, entity already has an identificator. It means that it, will, it was generated by the persistence APIs. It was generated by a communication with the database, so, so far so good. This is a common test in, in Java EE environments. And I, I also created a util class. The util class just made all the boilerplate necessary to create the actual testing class in Archelian, in which I included all the model package, all the util packages, and the persistence configuration, and the bin CML that uh, at this time is configured to allow all of kinds of, kind of injections in, in this project. So uh, finally, if you want to see it working, one way to see it is just to test if all is working properly. And you will notice a little thing in here. When you compile project by using Kotlin, one of the main disadvantages is like you actually have a new compile phase. Like in here, I have the Kotlin Maven plugin. This compile phase will actually take a little bit of time, uh, two, three seconds, if compared from the, with the regular Java, Java compil compilation time. So this uh this application is actually taking a little bit of time more in order to build itself after that after the build all of the tests started to run i am de deploying this application in a payara embed uh, version uh, now it's just starting the tests and i hope all the tests will pass in a couple of seconds let's see what happens 
Okay, that's it. My unique test was written entirely in Kotlin by using just pure Jack RTIE and microprofile components. And I am able to test it in a compatible implementation of microprofile like, or Jakarta implementation, like in this case, Payara Micro. So once I'm sure that the source code is uh, already running, I could actually invoke and deploy this application by using uh, Payara Micro as, uh, as application server. I could say, please don't activate the cluster at this time, and please uh, look for your own HTTP port and please deploy my regular uh, WAR file name integrum e.war. So this will boot a micro version of IR that, uh, as Adam stated, is uh, and actually one of the coolest implementations of micro profile, not the unique implementation, but actually pretty good. I am using this in production. And you can see that I am able to deploy the traditional WAR file by, by using just a command line interface. So in here, I, could, I have actually uh, the URL where the service is published. So I could see the service in a web browser in which I can say, please go to Integro, rest, hello. And hello says there is no place like my Java home. And this is running at my host. Uh, Currently name my, my name Falcon 2 because I am fan of Star Wars, as you could guess. But the important part is if you could if you could see the, the phrases endpoint, uh, I started with an empty database, but after the database was empty, okay, this is pretty. And this is gonna let me check it again. There is some issue here. Okay, hello, is running? Okay, here they are. I had a typo in the URL. So, Titler says that actually Kotlin is cool, but the the OER ranking of programming languages says Java is still the king. So I am actually taking the best of two words in order to develop this application. And finally, uh, I promise that I will do a demonstration not by using just one microservice, but using an entire implementation of microservices. So uh, in order to take this application to your cloud, you could basically use a Docker file. And the Docker file for Payara Micro is pretty straightforward in which you could start from the Payara micro image. Uh, after that, you have to copy the WAR file from your application to the deployment here that is actually covered by uh, uh, environment variable. And after that, I've also configured this project in order to compile itself and to be published over a cloud. So since I already did the compilation for my WAR file, I've also integrated this project. Docker starts to create the image. This will be published to Oracle Cloud, basically because I have at this time credits for Oracle Cloud. And that's it, I am testing it on Oracle Cloud. The layer already exists. This has been pushed for the Oracle Cloud registry. And on the Docker Compose side, I am provisioning the infrastructure as code in which I am creating three services. First of all, the database that will start with a clean database. It doesn't matter because I already have migrations of my code. After that, I have an image of my microservice with Bayara Micro. As you can see, I've externalized the configuration. I, I am using the classic uh, dummy Postgres uh, password that is expressed in Spanish, and I am using a reverse uh, proxy engine X as the actual gateway for this microservice. So after I, I created the basic deployment descriptor for the uh, Docker Compose part, I will enter to my instance in Oracle Cloud. I have it ready right here. Let's say I'm a Kotlin, and I can say Docker Compose pool in order to update the images. And when this image is ready, I can say, please, Docker, 
specifically Docker and Chrome Pulse. Uh, please boot up this infrastructure, including database, including the reverse proxy, and including the microservice with Payara Mic. And I can say, please, at this time, uh, provision two copies of the Payara Micro microservice. So you can see the actual uh, fault tolerance and scalability of the Payara Micro implementation. So let's wait a little bit for this for these two boots. And to wait for this, so basically, I created this. Uh, first of all, I created a Java Persistence API entity in which I could highlight that I, I'm using data classes from Kotlin and I had to use nullable types in order to allow some fields of this class to be null. Uh, after that, I am using a CDI repository in which I am declaring a late init nullable type because uh, the responsibility of to create this, in, this instance for this field in the class is an entire responsibility of the application server. Uh, after that, uh, I took advantage of single expression functions, or uh, as you probably will find them in many of the documentation, one-line methods, in which I am expressing the persistence, merging, deleting, and find by ID faces by using just one line of code in each of the functions. Uh, and of, uh, after that, I demonstrated the CDI repository in which I am using the multi-line securing approaching on Kotlin in order to create complex queries. You could see the advantage on this. Finally, the JAXA REST controllers were not so different from Java. And actually, I, one of the caveats that I found with this uh, approach is that sometimes you could be using more code to create the annotations for if compared to the code itself, like in the get method or in the other versions of the get method. And in the delete, I am using the Elvis operator as an expression, so I am able to generate the result. And after generating the result, I could immediately return the result by using the return sentence in, in Kotlin. So uh, I hope this is running now. Okay. So I published this service. You could actually see it at your house. I hope that this doesn't fall too short. And uh, if I do a, a request to my already published service and I say the hello, it says there is no place like Java Home, but this time the Java Home is the Java Home inside the Docker container. And I'm also showing the direction, the IP address in the microservice. And if you could see, if I do the request a second time, the second time the IP is switching because I am not using one instance, but two instances of the same microservice. And as the default configuration in, in, in Nginx, I am switching from one instance to another each time that I am doing the, the request. And finally, if I go directly to OT dot my name eighty eighty integral rest phrases, and I could actually see live and on the cloud all of the phrases that were implemented in my application. So that's basically the main idea. Uh, the key takeaways of this presentation is it is easier to develop. Uh, microservices with your actual Jakarta e knowledge. You could use Kotlin if you want to. Uh, I like many of the Java languages. I like Scala, I like Kotlin, as I said previously. But if you want to or you need to integrate the, some developers, some mobile developers onto your backend uh, development team, you could do it now by using Kotlin. Uh, I have not found so many caveats by integrating Kotlin in Java IE. So uh, you already saw the publishing steps. I published this in Oracle Cloud. <clears throat> so my conclusions are the following. Uh, Kotlin is good because it allows you to do static typing. I love a lot of static typing languages. The Java Interop, as you probably saw, uh, Jakarta e is one of the biggest frameworks or implementation or standards that you could see out there. And it is actually usable with Kotlin. It will give you good uh, object-oriented development tools with functional programming development tools. It will include new safety, extension functions, operator overloading, data classes, and one-line methods. That these are probably the features that most of the people like when are starting with Kotlin. Uh, and some interesting fact that I found by while using Kotlin is that many of the uh, uh, actual Kotlin constructs 
are based on the construct published on the effective Java book that is basically a Bible for all of the Java developers in which you can see that the concepts like immutability, build the pattern, single pattern, override, final by default, and variance bar generics are covered also already in the language you need to create the entire patterns that as you could probably do it in Java. And some constructs, if you have been doing Java JVM development for a lot of time, are actually inherited or inspired by other JVM languages, like the Elvis operator, it works like uh, it works on Groovy, the type inference immutability, and the way that you declare identifiers is the same that in Scala, and the new values management and the functions are probably very, very similar, not the same that in Groovy. I know this is a strong statement, so don't take my word for granted, but that's the thing that I observed by using Kotlin. And uh, in the same way, why don't use Java? Well, Java has been dying since 1995, and will be dying for a lot of theater years. Uh, each year that I heard that Java is dying is because I think Java is healthy, because uh, it's a language that people like to bash about because it is there and you will find a lot of Java in the in the streets. But if you want to experiment other languages like I did in this presentation, you have actually a lot of elements that came not from Java as the language but from Java as the as the environment. Like you have a lot of frameworks, not only MicroProfile or Jakarta E, but please give it a try. It's a good framework. Uh, you have a uh, raw performance, as it demonstrated, in tools like Apache Beam, Apache Spark, Apache Hadoop. The tooling is superb. You won't find other languages like Java in which you could have good IDEs, uh, software configuration management tools like Maven, database connectivity with any kind of database connectivity you could actually have, you have covered it, you have to cover it with Java. And in the JVM, if you need to justify why to use the JVM, basically, Twitter is doing it, Alibaba is doing it, Spotify is doing it, and you can use OpenJDK as I did in this presentation, so all it works. And my conclusions, advantages, uh, you could get concise code once you get the new structure. Uh, Kotlin has good Java interpretation, uh, this will open a new backend uh, options for new Android developers that don't, don't have too much experience with Java. If this is, uh, I don't like this word too much, but this is actually a full stack approach in which you could create your backing services with Kotlin and MicroProfile, and you could actually create the client with Kotlin and same, uh, let's say, an Android application. So some disadvantages that I found with this approach, uh, you have to use actually IntelliJ IDEA, and if you have to work with monoliths, you have to use IntelliJ IDEA Ultimate. Otherwise, you won't be able to use Kotlin with Jakarta IE. This is basically because Kotlin doesn't have good support in NetBeans. Uh, actually, JetBrains dropped out support from NetBeans a uh, couple of years. And in case you are accustomed to use Eclipse, the thing with Eclipse is that Java and Kotlin don't play really well in the same story. There is a bug that has been reported since two years ago, but I'm not sure if this will be fixed in, in a short period of time. Uh, Kotlin. From my perspective, uh, after developing Java for 10 years, I could say it is a difficult language to learn if compared to Java because you have to learn a lot of new things. You have an advantage if you already know Java because you will be find many concepts of, that you learn in Java as patterns will be part of the language. The compiler time, as I demonstrated, it will take a little bit of time, extra time uh, compared to projects in Java. And if you want to use coroutines, this is probably a bad idea because coroutines are like the new thing on, on Kotlin, but uh, most of the uh, most of the development and deployment environments in Jakarta IE are thread managed that uh, are very consistent and try to abstract all the all of the thread management from you. And I don't know, but most of the these cool features that are already in Kotlin uh, could be probably in the future in Java, like you could check the project Amber in which I've seen a lot of advancement in the Java language, a uh, project like Loom that is also creating some kind of lighter thread like the coroutines in, in Kotlin. So probably if you, you want to see the evolution of Kotlin and the evolution of Java in the following years, that this will be probably be available too in Java, Java 16, Java 18. So that's it. Uh, I hope to 
uh, I hope that you like this presentation and this is my contact if you want to share some ideas about this presentation I will be publishing on Twitter and it will be probably be published on the Eclipse site so I'm not sure if they have questions. Okay. I see a lot of questions. Uh, well, I I will review some questions. Interesting choice to stick with Maven. Yeah, probably I like Maven a lot. So for me, it is easier. I know this could be achieved with Gradle, but you could do it with Maven too. Okay. Uh, Let's see if there is another question. Uh, yeah, with Java 8, we will see, we will still make good money. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, actually, this code also runs on Java 11, but the demonstration wasn't uh, uh, ready. Oh, okay, I forgot this. Mm -hmm. You could also, the, I will review the question. You could actually inject the data source instead of looking it up. Just, just of course, I was just trying to look at it up in order to see, to demonstrate another structure of Kotlin, but this could so, be um, done by just injecting. Victor, if you want to um, pop up the questions um, from the uh, ask a question, um, or I can read it for you. So here, here is a quick question. You could okay. also, uh, hold on, instead of looking, well, that's a bit more, more comment. What job is it to manage the nulls, the language or the programmer? Whose job, uh, well, whose job is to manage it? For me, well, it depends because uh, I think when that when you start to do a lot of software, you could actually manage the nulls by yourself. And I am speaking from the perspective of a guy that has been doing street development for a lot of years. So I think that nulls could be managed by the developers. The thing is that not every team would, could be or, or will be composed by rock stars. Like not every everyone is working on Silicon Valley. And from experience, I could say that uh, you will be in mixed teams. And this is a good feature of coupling. The, the out the checking nulls embedded in the language will help you to prevent like uh, uh, to prevent the null pointer exceptions. And the other question is, what do you prefer personally, Java or Kotlin? Why can't you see strong points in Kotlin? Will they be brought to Java? Well, my personal preference is still Java because it is easier for me in my role to explain code in Java because uh, it, it will be probably easier at this point of time to find good Java developers compared to Kotlin developers. Uh, I think that Java has this good mix between uh, good code, but also a good expressive code. And I don't mind too much about getters and setters because anyway, you can generate this by using Lombok or by using the ID function. So I actually prefer Java. Uh, some strong points from Kotlin that we could take from Kotlin to Java. I will suggest the concise syntax for the methods. There are methods that could be concise just by dropping the the unit and finish indicators and just put one line. I, I like that from Kotlin. Uh, another uh, option that I like it too from Kotlin, uh, well, uh, I like the null management, I could say. Uh, it avoids a lot of issues. I'm not sure if that will, that will work on Java because many of us are accustomed to, to Java, to the Java way of managing nulls, but I think that the, the syntax Specific, specifically, the one-line methods could be a good improvement in Java. And as far as All I right, know, they will be included. Uh, we're at the top of the hour, so I would just like okay. to say thank you for your great presentation. And if there are any further questions, feel free to drop them uh, into the Ask a Question box, and we can send them right over. Uh, this recording will be live after the session ends, and we'll pull everyone into the next session. So thanks for joining us, guys, and we'll see you at the next one. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.